Hello and welcome to Linux Lads, episode 123. As usual, I'm Shane, joined by the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Amalith, Connor and Mike, to be specific. So we're just going to get straight into it. Uh, Amalith, uh, Thea, I believe it's pronounced. Uh, tell us what that is. From what I understand, Thea is a sort of like a rebuild of VS Code, almost like VS Codium, but they've stripped out even more of Microsoft's components, rewritten things. And it used to be a very DIY editor. They give you the source code, but you have to pull in the dependencies and build everything yourself, clone your whatever plugins you wanted to add and actually build them in at build time. You couldn't really install anything after the fact from what I remember. So at that point, it's sort of like a VS Codium. You have to patch in support if you want to add a plugin store or something. And then Thea came out with a beta build of their desktop version. And now there's the OpenVSX store, openvsx.org. And it's an open marketplace for VS Code compatible plugins that would work in VS Code, VS Codium, or in Thea, or any Thea-based IDE as well. I think so far, the Arduino IDE has been rebuilt on top of Thea as its like base, and Arduino has added on stuff to make it work particularly well with Arduino hardware. Uh, they're also working on, I don't remember the name of it at the moment, but it's a Kubernetes-based framework for Thea-based editors that lets people stand up Gitpod slash GitHub Codespaces clones where the IDE is that bespoke IDE that's customized however you like, has your proprietary components if you want, whatever. Arduino could spin up a Gitpod clone for interacting with an Arduino. I don't know how that would work, given that the Arduino has to be, you know, wired into the computer, but it's still a cool idea. So so it's basically, you can, like, I understand that you can basically create your own extension store and have it with only the extensions that you want. So if you are a large organization or an open source project and you say, I only want these extensions and I don't want anything else to be allowed for various reasons, be it security or uh, compliance or whatnot, that's perfect. But uh, what are some other advantages of using Thea, I would think? Of using Thea in general, I think it would be cool to build my own editor. So I can have, I can pre-configure it with all the plugins and everything I like, spit out a build, and then when I'm setting up a new system, all I do is install that and it's ready to go with everything I like. I don't have to do any further configuration. That might end up being a ton of upfront work that's I don't want to deal with, but it's a cool idea nonetheless. What is the advantage of doing the same thing in a Kubernetes cloud? I don't know. I don't see the appeal of GitHub Codespaces or Gitpod or any of those services, but they exist. They make tons of money. I, someone must see the appeal in them. I, I guess I could see it as being able to do real heavy development work from like a Chromebook, because all you need is a browser or an iPad or, or whatever. It moves the configuration and setup and resource use from your machine to someone else's machine. And it could be controlled by your organization. They have particular security policies that they can enforce through this code spaces like system. I don't know. You just introduced me to the idea of an absolute hell where suddenly the 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 the, the expense of running decent hardware <laughs> is going to be shifted to the data center and every single one of us is gonna be connected to some supercomputer via the cheapest, shittiest, pl <laughs> most plasticky, ugly, flexible Chromebook that they can buy from Dell or HP for 10 euros a pop. No, I don't want that. No, no, no. <laughs> exactly. You know, kill it before it lays eggs. I don't want that at all. Uh, what, uh, what I really want is whenever I go to be, to have a choice of decent developer machines, I know I'm super privileged in this, but for goodness, goodness sake, like, Give, give the tools that the tools that you are using shouldn't be adding friction. And in my experience as a remote worker over network, network just, just on its own, cloud adds friction. Sometimes you don't care. Sometimes it's super good, like Google Docs for, you know, Google and so on. They are actually pretty good, but I, ha but like it still adds friction. It doesn't always work if you put things like VPN into the mix and so on. And I, I do like the fact that I get decent hardware from my employer. 
And if that stopped being a thing, I would be very sad. I don't see any value in their cloud thing for me personally, but I love that they are doing it in an open way and making it so anyone can run these services on-prem if they like. Yeah, no, absolutely. So configurable developments, they are they are really important. If that is the fact that you can take something, make it all your own, and ensure that you control it, rather like if I kind of equate it or if I if I try to find an analogy in a non developer world, then if you think of cloud services, you think of something like Google Docs or more likely Microsoft three six five, for example, uh stuff like that, which nobody can really control except for Microsoft. So the fact that at least as far as development tools and, uh, you know, this kind of tech tools for tech workers, that, that there are options, that is on its own. That's good value, I think. So I discovered kind of a neat little app in Linux Mint that I had no idea existed. And this is probably old news to a lot of people. But uh, I discovered Hypnotics with a, an X at the end. It's essentially a TV tuner, and you can just get a bunch of TV channels from random countries. So if I want to watch Saudi Arabian TV, I can do that <laughs> if I so desire. And uh, I, I, I found it really interesting, like, especially when you go to the, the UK section, you can see all the all the BBC and channels and everything from all the different regions. And, and like, it's actually quite cool. Like, I, I found myself just watching random bits of TV, like just while it was on my computer just having a little window in one corner and it works quite well and it's actually kind of bizarre that i didn't even know this was here i've actually come across this before um i used to um subscribe to a iptv service and the legality of this is all very gray area so i'll just uh, say that i don't subscribe to it anymore yeah i was just able to download it and run it and yeah you're you're right it has a really nice in- interface and you just point it at the that um iptv file um if if that is what you're using and you'll suddenly have thousands of channels yeah this is uh this doesn't seem like um illegal or anything because it's bundled with the with the os and it has all of these countries just like all ready to go like presets the the free to air stuff yeah exactly like it's just like it's just terrestrial kind of tv channels um that have like public feeds or whatever you would call that so it's quite interesting like uh, it's uh i mean it's it's 99 percent of it's fairly useless because you know you're not it's going to be tv channels from different countries and you don't understand what they're saying but it is kind of curious to just like click on a random country like, oh, what sort of TV do they watch in Kosovo, you know, <laughs> or Norway? You know, it, it's it's kind of a curiosity. But I did find myself uh, putting on like, uh, you know, mainly just for the UK TV channels, because I think they're just better. So I say it's like it will probably be like 10 percent useful and the rest of the 90 percent is either split between those random foreign language um, stations or Euro news. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Euro news. Yeah, the same news happens every single hour. <laughs> if you pick up a phone, you might get even showing up something on PBS. Yeah. <laughs> So before we started recording, Mike did mention Super Tux Cart, which I think is interesting because it has a new version. No, it has. It is going to have. That is going to be a version 2.0. Yeah, but I was quite surprised by this because, like, that's a golden oldie. You know, Super Tux Cart was one of the few games that was pre-installed on Linux distros back in the day. And, uh, like, it's actually not a bad game. Like, I've played it a couple of times. Like, it's actually quite fun. Um, and I was actually quite surprised that it's still under active de- development. There's also... What's that other one? The, like, the first-person shooter, a bit like Unreal Tournament? Zonotic. Zonotic, that's the one. I played that before. That's actually quite fun. It's a little bit janky, but it's it's fun enough, you know? And it reminds me of old-school Unreal Tournament, which I used to play quite a lot. That kind of makes me wonder, though, like, open-source games is... Is that really a thing anymore? Like, or is it just like... Not many, but Zero AD, for example. Mm. Mindustry is a lot of fun, I think. Since um, Proton became a thing, a kind of everything was overshadowed by the by the fact that you can play regular Steam Steam games on, on Linux, and they are obviously not mostly not open source. But open source games are still going strong because people don't just want to play, they also want to develop games. 
So on this ARM64 Linux laptop, I pretty much only have uh, Zero AD. I have OpenTTD, which I believe also recently got an update, uh, Open Transport Tycoon Deluxe, which is like, you know, that game must be 30 years old now and it's still getting updates. So people are still working on these things and I assume people enjoy playing them. Uh, there's Open Raw for op- uh, Red Alert as well. We used to play Zero K a lot. Oh, Zero K is pretty cool, yeah. Yeah. And now there's Zero K and there's something um, called Beyond All Reason, which is pretty much based on the same engine that Zero K is based off of. There's also one that's relatively new in active development by some people I follow on the Fediverse called Lib Last. It's a Libre multiplayer FPS game built with Godot 4, and it's all open source. It looks a bit like a more modern Xenotic from the screenshots. I haven't played it yet. Oh, I'm not aware of this game. So just to make the discussion a bit more lively, what do you guys play? If you like most, what did you guys play most of over the last few weeks? If you played anything over the last few weeks, and uh, not much. I mean, the uh, literally just before we started recording this podcast, myself and more, my Norwegian friend were uh, checking out Stellaris or Solaris, which yeah. is pretty cool. And my most played game recently, if you go back over the last several months, would be Red Dead Redemption Two. <laughs> I like picked it up on sale. I'm like, eh, I'll kind of check it out, and then lost all of my free time to it. <laughs> like, <laughs> it is a ridiculously good game. I was actually going to say uh, Stellaris as well. Um, that's probably the number one game that I play. But that said, I don't play games frequently. I, I play them a few times a year, uh, very intensely for a, a week or two, and then I just don't play it again for six months. <laughs> that's kind of how I operate with games. I have Stellaris, and every time I open it, I'm just, oh my god, this is going to be a massive upfront investment in learning, and I don't have the time now. It's a heavy game, yeah. Uh, I I love the development studio. What is it? What are they called? Paradox. Paradox. Mm -hmm. I have um, Europa Universalis, and that's a great game if you can spend enough time to tweak it and are making... Uh, anyway, and uh, so yeah, I would once I have more time, I finish studies hopefully this summer. So once I have more time, I'm, I'm definitely going to learn Stellaris. It took me over a hundred hours of playtime to actually figure out how to be good enough to get to the late game in Stellaris. <laughs> I'd usually just get invaded by a neighboring empire or something and completely like destroyed within like like a few uh, like 20 or 30 game years like i i was so bad at it uh, that's that's frequently my my uh, thing with Solaris as well is i'm like in my own little corner uh working away don't mind it Every, everyone starts off as like the united nations and like we're like yeah cool we're trading and like yeah sure yeah uh, like let's Tra- trade like research and sure you can put in your ambassador on my planet and no problem whatsoever everything's kumbaya then the freaking space nazis come along with a distant giant invading fleet and you're like oh that's me done <laughs> yeah pretty much yeah that's my one gripe with that game is that it has all these mechanics and features and it has like espionage and research and economics and all, all these all these mechanics in the game but ultimately it boils down to build a load of ships and fuck them up you know <laughs> it, it always kind of comes down to warfare which is kind of something i i don't like about games in general is that it always has to come down to like killing each other and i don't say that in like a hippie hippie dippy kind of way i just it's just kind of boring i i want to win a game through other means you know i want to you know sure if i want to role play in that game and be like the space nazis and just build a load of powerful ships and just just blow your planet up and be horrible then that's fine that's what i'm playing as but then sometimes i want to have a different sort of game so i want to play as more of a science focused empire or a trade focused empire or something like that and i want to win the game through like forging alliances and like playing the political game in the galaxy and stuff like that i don't want to just like just like okay get a load of alloys and build a massive fleet and subjugate everyone like because that's what it ultimately boils down to in most games that i've played 
Yeah, you you mentioned politics, but like politics to a degree. But in, in Stellaris, they're like, oh, um, you're like, there's an election coming up. I'm like, uh, uh, like, uh, who gives two shits about that? <laughs> or yeah. do you want to do you want to set up this new edict for your for your new friggin' political term? I was like, uh, I'm in friggin' space. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. U- ultimately, all that stuff is is slightly pointless. It's really just for like min maxers who want to squeeze every drop out of every part of their empire but i've gotten to a stage now where i've I've learned how to play it fairly well and and i can survive until the end game uh just about and then you know there's an, an, an end game crisis where like a fallen empire like a really advanced empire who's like shrunk down to a just a few systems and they've kind of gone through a big war or something i don't know and the depends on their lore and they will just like awaken all of a sudden and they have all these like super advanced ships that can like just absolutely annihilate your ships from halfway across the system and stuff (laughs) and it's just like well i'm fucked (laughs) (laughs) i game with friends almost every night maybe more like five times a week on average and we've been playing lately call of duty black ops 3 it's an old game i think it's been out for 10 years now northgard which is a, it's a little bit like civilization, build up your clan, there are different ways to win a victory through fame, or trading, or annihilating the other clans, or capturing a particular tile on the map. I've also been doing Bioshock Remastered. I've started it and not finished it many, many times. I am determined to finish it this time, just like the other times. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I know. Uh, that's the one that I always get into because I like the story. It's it, and it's it's amazing. Somebody actually, yeah, it's very political, but then again, it's me, right? So somebody actually thought about it and made a game that makes sense. But I have a growing list of games that I want to learn once I have the time. Uh, and it's Stellaris. I want to properly learn Europa Universalis, Tropico Six, which. Looks like fun. I have the game. I haven't, I have played about 10 minutes of it. And then there's one thing that I decided never ever, ever to lose time again with. And that's, uh, Anno 1800. Because the game is good. I like the game. But every time, so I'm like Shane, right? I want to play a game every one month out of 12. And when I want to play a game, I want to play a game. But unfortunately, Ubisoft, I don't like them. (laughs) They create a launcher. You cannot launch the game without it. And it plays up on Linux badly. I think it's not much better experience on Windows probably either. But at least on Windows, it mostly works. But it's still shit. So whenever I want to play that game, I have to first start by installing the launcher and making sure that the launcher actually works, which is such a terrible experience for no discernible reason at all. I mean, you buy it on Steam. Ubisoft gets the money, so what do you need a stupid Ubisoft launcher for? But anyway, let me not rant about that. But so yeah, I have a negative list of games that I will not play, and Anno 1800 is on it. And I think actually I said list. I mean, it's just Anno 1800 for now. So uh, I'm curious. Um, you mentioned uh, Amleth, the game that was created in Godot. Um, that's something I have messed around with in the past i never really got that far i think i got halfway through like a tutorial on making a breakout style game where you hit a ball with a paddle and smash bricks it was it was very enjoyable i actually really liked it and i I really like how it works and stuff but i just never took the time to properly learn how to use it and how to create something because let's face it creating games i think that's that's kind of the pinnacle (laughs) you know that's the most probably the most fun thing you could do i mean for me anyway and i think that would be really enjoyable and rewarding if i could actually learn how to make games even simple ones um have any of you used it recently and like what sort of state is it in even um i'm curious to give it a go again never touched it no can say i have a last time i used it must have been uh well more than two years ago so not recently I'm actually making a game, but I'm using just uh, web-based technologies, FreeJS for 3D graphics and so on. I'm considering attempting to make a first game. I've never made a game before, but I found this project called Hoot, H-O-O-T. It's a project by this group called Sprightly, and it provides a full-featured WebAssembly toolkit in Scheme. 
It includes a scheme to WASM compiler, so it allows scheme code to run in modern browsers as a first-class citizen. And people have built simple, very performant games in it. There are some example templates I've seen around. Lisp Game Jam is coming up in... I don't, I don't remember exactly when. It might be the end of May. And they have an, I think they have an official template repository on how to make a game for the Game Jam using Hoot with some examples that you can follow while you're making your own game. And that might be cool to explore. I've never looked at anything similar to Scheme. I am finding there's one thing that people... So, you know when people... Basically, I'm using AI to help me with the game, and I'm using it as a game engine, which I'm not sure yet if it's going to work. But if AI was not like useful for anything else, for this, it's golden. Because I can, I, I have never made a game at all. So I can focus, and it's a school project, and I'm on a deadline, so I had to sacrifice certain elements. I can do the 3D graphics, I can think of things, I can do UI element, all that kind of stuff, but I don't have the time to become a writer and develop a story. And, and then, based on that story, develop like game rules. Not even just the graphics or programming stuff, just developing a game in your head with rules and such. That is a someone's full-time job, right? So AI gives you, you can ask it things and it will give you something, but you are building a universe so you can make shit up. So it doesn't matter if it's real. You can, if you don't need necessarily something that reacts too fast, or if you do, if you can do preemptive kind of execution, you can integrate it into the game. And if the money AI costs now, it's, it's kind of cheap. Like, you know, you can use it to generate scenarios by autoplaying. It can play itself and figure out for you Monte Carlo trees or something like this, right? So you can, you can make it to create the game by playing, create winning strategies and so on. And uh, it can give you not total randomness, but randomness that is good enough. Like imagine in SimCity, every now and then there would be a fire or a Godzilla came and destroyed everything you built, right? That's gener- a back then, I'm pretty sure that it was generated by some internal clock. The problem with that approach, obviously, is that if it's deterministic, you even no matter how complicated it is, as long as it's deterministic, somebody will find a way to game this. To, to, uh, there will be a problem with it. Somebody will uh, find a way to uh, find a loophole uh, in the game's behavior. AI gives you what possibly could be, we don't, I don't know, obviously, but it could be uh, non-deterministic, what is it called, probabilistic behavior. It's a black box that you give something and it gives you something. Uh, and that's interesting for games as well. So I'm basing my... Okay, my, my last project in university, I'm basing it on the fact that I think I found a good use for AI um, for something. I hope it works out for me. Sounds great. Yeah, accounting for all that stuff is a, a lot for one person to take on. How I was trying to learn game development before, no, I didn't get very far, as I said, but how I was trying to you know, approach it was to just take the, the simplest possible mechanic that I could think of, you know, so like bouncing a ball off a paddle or, you know, having a circle and making it move left, right, up and down and stuff, you know, just figuring out the absolute basics of how to just make something move on the screen. And I found that a good way to do it, you know, um, and limit yourself. And then, you know, you can almost build a bigger story around just a very basic mechanic. Some some people start get into kind of or try to develop a game using what they know. So if you are not a game developer and you don't want to start learning 3D graphics and physics engines and so on, uh, you might start with some development that you already kind of have knowledge of. And I think somebody took it as far as creating a game in a sequel in sequel, which must be fun. Wow! I'll try to look it up and put it in the show notes if I find it. I saw somebody who created. Uh, I think it was in a. I think it was actually in a, ma- a Linux magazine that I, that I was reading. Uh, someone created a game in LibreOffice in the spreadsheet application uh, using like formulas in in the in the cells and stuff, which is kind of wild to me. <laughs> I mean, it, but if you think about it, I suppose it's entirely possible. You know, I mean, it's just. It's the same sort of principle. You're just moving info- information around and responding to user input and stuff. So, I, you know, it's not that weird when you think about it. I mean, sorry, but but spreadsheet would make for the shittiest Tetris ever. <laughs> <laughs> just the same block. 
Yeah. No, it's 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 snake. <laughs> oh yeah, it's snake. Oh, yeah, just make all the cells square. And... You could make actually because you can use visual. So spreadsheets have Visual Basic. Both uh, Microsoft Office and LibreOffice have some version of Visual Basic, and you could make snake out of it if you make it into a grid, into a square grid. You can make the cells a different color backgrounds, obviously, and that mm-hmm. in time would simulate the snake moving. But oh my god. Uh, Visual Basic is difficult, yeah. Yeah. Not difficult. Visual Basic is annoying to work with, at least for me. I I tried a few times and I hated it. Ain't nobody got time for that. Um, So yeah, this talk has inspired me. I think I'm going to give Godot another go. Yeah. I make a rhyme all the time. (laughs) (laughs) So that about wraps it up for this one. We will be back in approximately two weeks. Goodbye. Adios. Bye. Bye. We will trust in the Linux lads process.